So I hope you uh, enjoyed that video. Uh, it was kind of fun, maybe a little cheesy, but uh, it demonstrates a, a, an actual social engineering attack and it, it actually demonstrates the framework uh, pretty well, okay? So let's go through the framework and we'll see how it applies to this specific scenario. And then after that, then we'll go into more of the boring details of, of going through each of the elements of the framework and, and kind of working out the theory of it. Okay, so remember the framework is information gathering, pretexting, influence, uh, either a persuasion or elicitation. Okay, so let's start with information gathering. So think about the video and think about what kind of information gathering did the attackers have to do before conducting the scam? So I'll pause, I'll, I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, so the answer is that there's actually not a lot of information gathering. So this attack is, is more a lot more about the pretext and about you know the persuasion uh, elic elicitation is actually the main one. Um, but th there's a few things that you might pick up on. And I should note that th this is just, it's not like I analyze every every little last detail, so, so I might be missing things as well. But um, the first thing is you, you need a location in order to conduct it. And so knowing that a food court is a good good sort of place to do it, you know, people are there, uh, they, they might not be looking at their, their handbags. Uh, there's other people's around. It's easy to, to distract them, like with, with asking them to take a picture, that type of thing. Um, uh, if you walk by and pick up the handbag, you're, you're maybe not as likely to, 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 someone's not, like there's the chance that a third party notices it, right? But food courts tend to be pretty busy and people are concentrating on, on talking and eating and things like that. And so anyway, it's just sort of, Picking that as it's not like the only location that would work. There's probably lots of locations, but it was it was a good location. OK, so some thought went into that. Um, then when you show up, you have to find a target. So they could have targeted anyone in that food court. OK, and so they're looking for someone where uh, the, the banking card is is probably I mean, there's always a chance that it's in their pocket or something like that, even if they have a handbag. But you're, you're looking for that. Um, in this case, the target was targeted because their friend had left uh, to use the washroom. Uh, so they were alone, at least for that moment. And um, <clears throat> they felt that they were able to distract them uh, in order to, to, you know, offer to take a picture. They didn't look unfriendly like they would say no to taking a picture or something like that. They weren't, you know, clutching their handbag. The handbag was sort of on a chair that was sort of, you know, beside them, that all of that type of thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So anyways, and then uh, there's also like the pretext, which we'll get into like what all they were, but each of the pretexts, you would also have to have some background information on like what what that pretext will look like. So I'm, I'm deliberately not saying what they are because I, I want you to think about that next, but um, there's, there's all the background researchers on creating a realistic pretext. Okay, so pretexting. So what, uh, what, what are the pretexts? So this is, you know, someone pretending to be someone that they're not. Okay, so what what elements of, of pretexting are there? So think think about it. Now I want to encourage you to. I mean, there's there's one that's obvious, right? Which is the 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 bank employee, right? Pretending to be the bank employee. But there's more than that pretext. So if that's the only pretext you got. Take another couple minutes and and think. Um, there's four by my count. You could maybe count them uh, in slightly different ways. Okay, so the, the four that I saw were um, there was the, the tourists uh, that were acting like tourists. It was sort of a spontaneous interaction. They asked for a picture. Okay, so that was the first one. Uh, they look like tourists. Uh, you know, they they um they looked like like there was nothing really about that pretext that 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 you wouldn't believe or you would think that there were people that were acting in that role okay they looked like they could be a couple like there was there was nothing really that was sort of off uh, i would say about that interaction um it was pretty um 
natural to ask someone else like you maybe been in places where you see other people taking pictures and 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 they ask other people that are around to take pictures and so there was anything like particularly strange about that interaction so it came off as as pretty natural and so some thought went into that uh in in terms of, of making that spontaneous okay now the result of that was that the victim was distracted and they weren't watching their handbag and so the uh the one guy who's actually the author of the book, uh, who's pretending to be, be the bank employee, uh, he was able to steal the handbag. Okay, then the bank employee, okay, that's the other pretext. And so also, again, there was, you know, bank employees don't necessarily look a certain way, but everything about the way he looked was consistent with what you might think of an, a bank employee or maybe a Hollywood interpretation of a bank employee. Right, you know, formal. He was wearing formal, like a suit. Uh, the briefcase is also something that that you tend to to, to use if in, in more formal uh, situations. Uh, the way he talked, he he was very confident, and he sort of took charge of the situation. Um, he knew about the processes uh, that banks used, uh, and all of those types of things. So so everything. Uh, sort of about that situation was was um, would lend you to believe that that it wasn't someone impersonating a bank employee. Okay, now you're you're never 100 percent sure, right? Um, but 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 anyways, then <clears throat> this is something else I thought of that that could have been clever uh, that they didn't do. But one one type of thing that uh, sometimes people look at as a piece of authentication, even though it's not, are business cards. So if you're like, I work at Concordia and pull out a business card and the business card says Concordia, somehow that adds credence to the idea that I actually work at Concordia, right? But the truth is that anyone, you can get a business card printed with any name and any logo that you want, right? So what the bank employee could have done is, he, he doesn't know, he, remember he asked her, you know, what, what bank are you with? She says Barclays. Then he says, oh, I work at Barclays. He doesn't come up to her and say, oh, I work at Barclays. What's wrong? Right. Like like that was. But it's, it's easy to miss that. Right. So she said a different bank than he would have said. I worked at that bank. And what he could do is he could actually have a business card of, of the five or ten major banks in his pocket. And then when she says Barclays, then he pulls out the Barclays business card and, and gives it to her. So anyways, that's just an idea for, for a way of, of making it even more realistic. Okay, another spoof is the call center operator, right? And so it sort of sounded like a call center. Uh, you know, you have the office noise playing in the background. The way they're talking sounds kind of like they're bored, like they, they, they talk on the phone all day. They're very polite, but but not necessarily engaged. They don't make small talk, it's sort of scripted, you know, like, like this is the 10th call that they've gotten that day about uh, somebody that's lost their bank card. Um, so, so anyways, everything about it was sort of tailored to, to make it seem realistic. And again, you're just trying to not have the victim have a shadow of doubt in their mind, right? Nothing is sort of off about it. And then the last thing you can call it pretext or not, uh, but w it would be that sort of automated system. Um, and so this, you know, also, you, you know, it was meant to be automated. So it sounded robotic, even though it was a human that was that was reading the script out. And they had like sound effects for tones and things like that, uh, that, that made it sound like you're, you're actually talking uh, to an automated system. Okay, uh, persuasion and elicitation. So this is what is the attacker trying to get the victim to do? So in terms of persuasion, they're trying to get them to do something. And elicitation is they're trying to give up information. So giving up the bank PIN number is elicitation. So that, that's the main uh, element of the um, of the social engineering attack, but that doesn't mean that there aren't smaller aspects of persuasion or other even other aspects of elicitation. So think for a second about is was there any aspect of persuasion beyond uh, you know just trying to get the pin number? So I noticed two. There there might be more. Uh, one was that you wanted to get the victim to turn their back on the bag. Uh, so that was with the distraction of the tourist asking for a picture. That's persuasion. I mean, you're, you're persuading them uh, to do something. And then the other one that's a big one is this whole attack worked because the victim used the social engineer's phone. Okay. If the victim had pulled out their own phone and said, okay, give me the number of Barclays, I'll call them. 
right? That, that may still work. You could give them a number that actually routes to you and they might not know whether it's a real number or not. Um, but anyways, like, but the, the fact that they use, you know, the, the victim's phone, uh, you know, that, that made the whole thing go very, very smoothly. Okay. And so, you know, he says he dials it. He doesn't even ask. He just is like, I work at Barclays, whips out the phone, puts the number in, you know, before she can even say anything. And, and it's like, here you go. Okay. And in this scenario too, it's, it's persuasion because it's not just, okay, so she could pull out her own. So think about the alternatives. So what are the alternatives? So she could use the phone, the attack works. She could pull out her own phone. Um, in this case, her phone's probably in the bag that's missing anyways. Okay, so that, that's another thing about uh, that, that makes the attack work a little nicer. Um, because she's at a mall, there's a good chance that there's a Barclays branch in the mall. So she could just say, uh, it's fine, I'll, I'll just go to the bank in person. And, and talk to them. And so that's actually a risk. So so a shopping mall might not be the best place to do this attack because that's an easy alternative uh, to, to, to accepting the phone. Okay. And then the fourth thing is to basically say, you know, oh, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to use your phone for this, uh, you know, um, and basically reject the offer to help. And the problem with this is it, it can sort of seem insulting, like you're sort of insulting the person. You're basically saying, I don't, I don't believe you, uh, you know, in, in terms of who you are. And so persuasion plays on that. It makes you have to do something that's emotionally uncomfortable or socially uncomfortable in order to do the right thing. So the right thing would be to not accept the phone and not use the phone. But, you know, because the way the scenario has been concocted, uh, you would have to do something sort of socially awkward to, to sort of get out of, of using that. You risk offending someone that's actually trying to help, supposedly, right? Uh, and so so all of that, I mean, that's manufactured to try and push you into just, you know, take the phone and, 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 and use it. Okay, and then elicitation. So you have uh, basically the, the idea of obtaining the pin is elicitation, okay? And so again, it's not just you ask and they say yes. It's you manufacture, like the, the adversary is manufacturing um, a scenario here to make it an easier option to just give up the information, right? So it's kind of a stressful situation. The idea of it being time sensitive, like if you don't cancel it quick enough, then the person who stole your card might use it, right? That That's sort of a subtext of, of what's happening. And so it makes it seem time sensitive, like, you know, I have this phone, I can just do it right now and in five minutes I'll be done. Or I can go to the bank or go home and call from a different phone or whatever. But, you know, that's going to be an hour later and, you know, by that time it might be too late or whatever, right? So putting that time pressure, that's a, a common tactic uh, that's used um, in order to persuade people, to, to influence people to do things, whether it's persuasion or elicitation. It's also stressful, so you're not thinking straight. Um, you know, this, this thing happened and... You, you want to fix it right away. You're not, you know, you don't have the luxury of time. You're not sitting back. You're not relaxed uh, thinking about it. It's a very stressful situation. Okay. So all of these tend to lead the victim to give up information more easily than they might otherwise. Um, the other thing is that the banker, you know, seems confident. They seem helpful. Um, so you have a kind of, we talk a lot in social engineering about a rapport, which is your kind of how comfortable you feel with the other person, right? So if the other person makes you feel comfortable, uh, then we would say you have a good rapport. And if they make you feel uncomfortable or they give some indication that something's just sort of off about them, then you might say you have a bad rapport. And so you, uh, you know, it's a human condition to, 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 to be more vulnerable to, to influence uh, by someone that you have a good rapport with as opposed to a bad rapport. Uh, the other kind of elicitation was the use of the automated system. So th this is all part of the same thing. I just, I split it out just so that we could talk about it specifically. Um, it's still about eliciting the pin. Um, so in this case, uh, they set up this idea that, uh, that the human operator can't take the pin off you. So you have to use the automated system. That doesn't actually really hold up. I mean... If the automated system can learn the pin, why why can't the human? Because there's some human that controls the automated system, even in a real life kind of banking scenario, and so so. Anyways, it, it it's kind of a a, a weird thing uh, from my view, but 
Uh, but anyways, it seemed to work and, and the person seemed comfortable using it and it seemed somehow more secure to, to give it to a robot as opposed to give it to an actual human. Um, so, so anyways, I, I can't argue with it if, it if it actually works, right? Now, one thing that's a little dangerous about it is you, they did say, I forget the exact quote, but, but, but they said, I'm, you know, the, the, the human operator said, I'm not allowed to take the pin off of you uh, for security reasons or something like that. And so what you're doing is you actually are planting a flag. You know, the person hears it. Now you've primed them to think about security. So now they're thinking about, oh, yeah, why, why, why is it that a human like this all happened so fast that, that it probably isn't a complete thought. But they you run the risk of them really sitting back and saying, oh, yeah, my pin is secret information and I can't just give it to everyone else. And this person, you know, this person's not going to take it off of me. Why should I trust this robot to take it off of me? And so you're kind of preloading this this idea of, you know, you're getting them to think about security when you actually don't want them thinking about security at all. Right. This is a scenario where you're trying to get them not to think about, you know, that's why it's stressful and, and it's time sensitive and things like that. You're trying to get them to abandon thoughts of security and just just get it done. Um, and so so anyway, so, so that's that's another thing about the attack that that's maybe a little dangerous. But anyway, so the point is that this um, framework is actually quite useful. We can use it to break down the attack. We can even see ways that the attack could maybe be uh, improved and maybe some areas where the attack might not work quite as well as, as you would think. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we'll go again slowly through all five, four, you know, like three, three plus two subcases. Uh, so we'll go through the framework kind of line by line, and I'll, I'll give you lots of information about information gathering stuff, background about pretexting and influence and all that. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll just tell you a bunch of stories, kind of like the video that we just saw about other social engineering attacks. Okay, so the first stage that may be present, it's usually present at least in some extent um, in a social engineering attack would be information gathering, okay? So this is where the adversary wants to learn as much as they can about the target. Uh, the more you know, it, it's usually always useful to know more as opposed to less. And so there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, but some common ways of doing it would be just starting by seeing what you can see from the internet. So the internet has lots of information, especially when the adversary is targeting a business. You know, businesses usually have websites. Uh, they might have the, some of the employees, like maybe the executives that work at the company. Uh, there's social media, uh, like LinkedIn, that's, you know, you could go and see, you could find all the employees that work at a particular company. You could learn the, the name of the division that they work for. You could try and figure out the org chart, as they call it, like who, who's who's boss uh, in the organization. Uh, you can learn names and, and maybe contact information and things like that. Then you can go beyond and look at personal social media. So, you know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or not LinkedIn, but uh, Instagram, uh, that, that Snapchat, whatever, um, TikTok. And you could... You know, try and, and then you could try and get gather like, you know, interests and other things. Maybe maybe they even talk about the company stuff uh, on social media as well. Um, you could see like, oh, they're hanging out with this person who they work with and, and, and that type of thing. Um, there's some tools that, that try and make this uh, automated. So, so a lot of this, if you're just pulling information off a website, that could be automated. Um, so a tool like Multigo will, will, will automate some of those tasks and find the links uh, between people and things like that, give you some visualizations. Uh, another thing that's used is password profiling. Uh, so this is where, say you want to guess someone's password or that's part of the attack. So the adversary knows that people pick passwords poorly. We've seen that in previous lectures. Uh, and so one thing that someone might do is they might actually choose a password that's sort of based on some of the business terms that they're using. Like say there's a product name or something like that. And sometimes products have weird names, like they're not like a typical English name that's in an English dictionary. Uh, and so the, it kind of looks like it might be a good candidate for, for a password. Um, and so what an adversary might do is they might just scrape the company website, distill it down into just the words that appear on the on the company website 
and then they can they can build a password guessing dictionary out of it. So they they'll include all of those words, but they'll include variations, you know, substituting numbers for letters, that type of thing, like the number the the number three for the letter e, you know, those, those kinds of substitutions. Try and compound words, you know, matching up two of the words and things like that. So um, anyway, so that that's that's a way that you can um, that the, the adversary might tailor. Uh, a, a basic just password guessing attack against a specific person. Okay, another thing uh, that's very, very useful is that, that you can often glean from things like social media would be vacation plans. Okay, so vacation plans are important uh, for an adversary to learn because when someone goes on vacation, there's a disruption to who's doing what tasks. Like someone, if they go for a vacation for a long time, like say a week or two weeks, then somebody else has to fill in for them uh, in their in their job. Okay, and so let's say let's just go back to the the basic example of you're pretending to be an IT person and you want access to a server room. Think of the administrator that normally would would say yes or no. That administrator, you know, they deal with IT people all the time, they probably know their names, they know their faces. And so when you show up saying that that you're there, that person's going to recognize that 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 you're not, you know, actually one of the people that they've interacted with in the past. Now you might have a story or a cover for for why that's the case. But it, anyways, it, it adds to the complexity of, of the social engineering attack. Um, but if that person goes on vacation, now there's someone else that's sitting there. And that person has no idea, right? They, they, they maybe cover that that desk, you know, for two weeks every year, just when this other person's on vacation, right? And so they don't, they don't know who the normal people are. They don't know all the protocols and the procedures and things like that because it's not their day-to-day -day job, okay? So they might not be familiar uh, with everything. And so they might be an easier target uh, to, to, to influence and, and try and get what you want. Now, this can also backfire. You could get the exact opposite, right? It might be that uh, because it's not their day-to-day -day job, they're really diligent and kind of paranoid about doing something wrong and so they're actually a lot more strict with the rules uh, and they follow the rules you know to the letter whereas the person who's been doing it for four or five years they tend to bend the rules um so so it, it doesn't necessarily work in your favor it could it could go either way but uh there is that chance that 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 um that that disruption, uh, you know, changes the person that you're interacting with and, and their sort of experience, their past experience in that job. And that that could change how easy an adversary finds it to influence. Um, there's other kind of disruptions beyond vacation. So it could be, you know, some sort of construction. So construction could be as simple as as like there's doors that normally are locked, but now they're not locked because construction crews are going in and out. Uh, and so the door is just held open. Right. Or you could think of a kind of emergency kind of scenario, like say, well, very simply, let's say you pull the fire alarm, the adversary pulls the fire alarm. Now everyone's outside of the building. The adversary kind of blends in with the crowd. And now everyone's going back in the building. And normally like people kind of go in one or two at a time, but now you have 500 people that are all going into the building at the same time. They're a lot more likely to hold a door that would normally be locked open for the person behind them so like not everyone's swiping on the way in um you know because it it, it, would, it would take too long and so that's a kind of scenario where it's kind of unusual it's out of the normal routine and so people kind of drop their diligence uh in terms of security uh another attack vector that was that most corporations know about now and so they're very very careful about uh but it used to be um it used to be a very profitable uh, attack vector for for social engineers is just going through garbage, right? So a lot of times garbage is is picked up by the municipality. So it's it's on public streets. Uh, you know, it needs to be publicly accessible for the municipality to to, to to pick it up. And there's all sorts of things that people throw out, right? So there's um, you know pieces of paper uh, that that could have data on it, figures, you know, economic information. Um, accounting information it could be bills it could tell you you know who this company has relationships with uh, it could be it documents it could be like like say you get a new computer and uh they tape a piece of paper with the username and password on it they tell you to change the password but most people just 
not most, but some people will, will maybe just not change the password and they'll throw the piece of paper in the garbage. And so eventually it ends up in the garbage and, and now you have a username password uh, for a machine. Um, and then it, it doesn't have to be paper. It could be equipment like old computers and there could be hard drives and, and, and things like that, right? Um, so most corporations now are, are more careful about what they throw out. Um, they'll make sure that documents are shredded uh, before they're thrown out. They'll use private garbage companies to pick up their garbage uh, and you need access to even access the garbage so it's not like it's just out on the curb of a public sidewalk uh, yeah and and all equipment will be you know the the hard drives will be taken out and, and things like that and then the equipment will be dis disposed of and the hard drives will be erased and things like that or recycled um, so so anyway so so corporations are, are, are more careful about this but th but this is another example that that classically was was very important uh, for social engineers. Okay, the next thing is uh, pretexting. So very simply, pretexting is um, impersonating someone that you're not. Uh, <coughs> what a pretext does is it's not. It's important to understand that the the goal of the social engineering attack is not the pretext. Okay, the goal is the influence, the, the getting the person to do the thing that you want them to do or getting the information that you want from the person. That's the goal. So a pretext is a means to an end. It's, it's a way of trying to accomplish the goal or, or kind of get you closer to the goal. Okay, so specifically what a pretext does, a good pretext, is it gets you closer to the person that you're, that you're targeting. So if the social engineering is, is, is targeting a specific person, They'll use a pretext basically to, to, to try, try and get them in the same room as that person or try and get an email to that person to actually be read by that person. You know, pretext can, can look different ways. It, it, it's not always humans either, like we saw in the automated robot system in, in the uh, previous video that, that you know, it, 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 yeah, pretext isn't necessarily human either. Um, but anyway, so the point is to get the social engineer in close proximity with the potential, with the target, uh, that's what the pretext does. And then once they're in close proximity, then persuasion, elicitation, as as it, uh, you know, influence as the umbrella term, um, that's going to be used to actually achieve the attack itself. Okay. So if if you just get them to believe that you're an IT person, that in and of itself isn't useful. Okay. So uh, this is from a book, uh, a paper book that I have, and unfortunately I lost it, and I can't for the life of me. I've Googled a lot to like uh, to try and give credit to the author of this book, um, but but um, I don't have the physical book before, and I, I took the picture and I forgot to denote it or, or it got lost or something like that. So I don't, unfortunately, I, I can't give credit to, to where this came from. But uh, anyways, it, it's a really nice list of uh, some of the pretexts that, that would be common in a social engineering attack. So um, I won't read all of them. You can kind of look through them yourself but we've talked a lot about like sort of it support i usually frame it as external like you hire an external company but it can be internal as well so if it's a big enough corporation uh then it could be like somebody comes they say they they work at the same company as you but they're from the it division and and you don't because the company's so big you don't like concordia is a good example like i i wouldn't know all the it people uh based on 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 you know personally knowing them recognizing them uh, tourists is an example we saw in the video, you know, asking for, for a picture. There's all sorts of like kind of relationship based things like family members, spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, partners, um, that, that kind of thing. Um, okay, uh, you can impersonate uh, um, actual people with authority, right? So it could be police, law enforcement, uh, fire, ambulance emergency services, that type of thing. And just harking back to the very first slide where I said, talked about legal and ethical issues, uh, I, I just want to flag the fact that, you know, as, as soon as you impersonate a law enforcement officer, that's immediately illegal. That's a crime, uh, period. Okay. So a lot of these, if, if, if somebody's doing it in order to attack someone else, they're going to be crimes as well. Okay. But the pretext of, of, of doing things like, like, pretending to be law enforcement is, is just a crime. So even if you're, say you're at it, like say you work for a security firm and someone hires you to test whether they, they have good social engineering practices or not, 
uh, things like like dressing up like a police officer, you, you, you just can't do. It's illegal even if, if you have permission to, to do it against the company. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, so insect control is another thing where, where it might be like where people would normally get access to a room that they, they might not have access to. Delivery, um, you know, cleaning, maintenance, that type of thing. Okay, so what do social engineers do in order to, to do a good pretext? Okay, so the first thing is uh, a social engineer will struggle with pretexting. If they're pretexting, say, an IT worker and they don't know anything about IT, that's going to be a struggle because, you know, maybe they show up and they say, I need access to the server room. And the person says, oh, you're from IT. Great. I actually have a problem on my computer. Maybe you can fix it real quick. And then, and then you can go into the server room, right? And so that pretext might break down if they're unable to convincingly, you know, at least diagnose the problem or, or, or something like that, right? Um, so having some level of expertise uh, is important. And then confidence is also very important as well, right? So, so social engineers will, will be very confident and um, sort of try and use that also as, as a form of influence uh, because you wouldn't question someone that was so confident is, is the idea. Um, okay, now pretexting is, is a form of lying, right? And maintaining a lie is cognitively draining. So you spend a lot of brain cycles thinking about, you know, whether you're projecting correctly and um, all the little details and, and trying to find the right words and the right jargon and things like that. So um, social engineers will find it difficult, you know, to just go in and, and, and just lie, but then also pay attention because in order to use influence, you need to sort of track the conversation and, and try and think about, okay, what's, what's a kind of tactic that would work with this individual. And if they're telling you information because you're eliciting it, you have to remember that information on top of lying. And so anyway, so so it's, it's sort of harder than it seems, right? Um, so, so anyway, so what social engineers will do is they'll do things like they'll record uh, the information so they don't have to remember everything and, and, and things like that to try and reduce the cognitive uh, burden. Um, they'll also like sort of storyboard out the conversation. So like, I'm going to ask this, They're, they probably will say one of three things. And so if they say the first thing, then this is how I'm going to respond. If they say the second thing, this is how I'm going to respond. And the idea of this is to just not get surprised um, and be able to anticipate the kinds of things that, that might be talked about. But they also, they don't want it to come off as scripted or memorized. Like they're just sort of, you know, they memorize the script and they're, they're kind of going through it. Okay. Because they want it. The social engineer wants it to be a, a very natural like kind of uh, conversation, right? Um, and so anyway, so, so it's a fine line to walk, uh, but, but social engineers will usually spend some time anticipating where the conversation will go and thinking ahead about what they would say in response to certain types of um, things uh, and, and not memorize it. Okay, uh, I mentioned recording, so that's a way of also sort of not having to remember so much information. Uh, and then there's also it like it, it's really difficult to always put your finger on why a victim or a target might think that there's something off about the person. So in the, the ideal, the best world scenario is the target will realize, oh, this is someone that's impersonating IT and not actually IT. OK, and so there has to be something that that triggers that or actually maybe in the ideal world it's just that they have very strict policies and so they're like you you know you're not registered you don't have access or, or whatever the case may be and then you don't have to rely on on people like ideally you don't want your employees to have to to, to figure out whether someone actually works for who they say that they work for or not right so you have a bunch of rules and procedures that are meant to protect the organization okay but uh let's say in the in the fallback scenario the target starts to recognize that, oh, maybe this person isn't who they are. Or they just, something feels wrong about it. It's hard to like put your finger on what it is about them. Okay, what what is it about this person that just kind of feels off? Um, but, but anyways, it, it could come down to like small details uh, being off. Uh, so small details in how they look. Um, by look, I mean like how they're dressed or, or like the equipment that they carry. 
um, the words that they use, the jargon that they use, how they talk, uh, that type of thing. Um, so anyway, those those details. Uh, do they do they seem like um, like uh, if they work within the company? Uh, yeah, do do they know the lingo of the company itself? Um, so like if they're saying I don't know product names or, or things like that or IT service names or things like that. You know, if, if they mispronounce something, uh, like those, anyway, these, these are like the like kind of subtle things that, 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 you know, a social engineer really has to prepare for. Okay, then we move on to the forms of influence. Uh, so influence is uh, trying to, to, when the social engineer tries to get the target to do what the social engineer wants, um, they have to know what they want. Okay, so it's not like you just sort of go in open-ended and, and sort of see what happens, right? The social engineer usually has a specific outcome or it's better to plan a, an attack around a specific outcome. Um, they, as I mentioned with the conversations, there's a lot of planning uh, that would go into the attack and contingencies meaning like, if the victim does this, what am I going to do and, and, and that type of thing, okay? Um, so trying to think of all the different scenarios of, of what might happen and, and what the reaction would be. OK, now, not every social engineering attack is going to work. Right. Sometimes it's, it's not going to work. And so your contingency will be how do I, you know, how does a social engineer get out of the situation um, without raising suspicion? Right. How can how can they exit the situation? Um, and so that that would be part of the contingency as well. And then any kind of disruption, so like emergency, construction, people on vacation, the things that we talked about earlier, um, you know, that could that could influence when you choose to, to do the attack. Uh, and so, so engineers will, will, will try and time their attacks to, to exploit any, if any of this stuff happens to be available and it's exploitable, then, uh, then that, that's when the attack will happen. Okay, now within influence, there's, there's two types. So there's elicitation, I want information from the target, and persuasion being I want the target to do something. Okay, so elicitation, the social engineer wants uh, secret information. Uh, so it's information that they couldn't otherwise obtain. So they, they need to interact with the target in order to get this information. And there's a couple of techniques that are used uh, to make elicitation easier and they to some extent, will overlap with uh, with persuasion as well. So they, these aren't necessarily exclusive to just elicitation. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing we, we, we kind of mentioned in passing this idea of a rapport, which is sort of like, how much do you like the other person that you're dealing with? And so sometimes, like if we go back to the video we watched, the bank employee, he didn't really build a rapport you know, he, he sort of went in and, and was very authoritative, like, um, I work at the bank, I'm going to call them, you're going to talk to them, kind of thing, okay? And so that worked in that particular case, okay? Uh, but other times you 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 might, especially if it's, it's sort of um, a longer interaction or if it's not this sort of time pressure kind of scenario, uh, then building a rapport might, might make it easier for the social engineer to elicit the information they want. So being likable so the other person likes them uh being friendly uh trying to be funny making them laugh you know telling jokes uh that type of thing um based on the information gathering stage the social engineer might know things about the target for example i don't know you your favorite sports team for example and so they might somehow try to work that into the conversation and, oh, I like that sports team too. And, 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 you know, that type of thing. And so the, the idea is that you sort of are on friendlier terms and then you might be more likely to, 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 to give the social engineer what, what they want, right? What they ask for. Um, flattery works as well. So complimenting, uh, the social engineer might compliment the victim or, um, yeah, that, that type of thing. Um, you can do preloading. So preloading is when you try to subtly introduce a subject uh, before you actually have a conversation about it. Okay. So for example, let's say that you, um, 
your yeah so we'll use the example on the slide so so you're an it your pretex is that your it support staff uh you want access to the server room because you have to perform an upgrade okay and you're showing up at exactly i don't know 2 p.m in order to do this okay so you can do that you can show up out of the blue but what you could also do is you could send an email it would be a, a, a spear phishing email in the sense that it's it's fraudulent um and you would send it only to the victim but you might make it look like you sent it to the whole company and it might just say like you know re remember that there's going to be server to downtime from 2 p.m to 4 p.m today okay and so the victim reads it they don't really think much of it like like the ask in that information um isn't in it's not in the content of the email itself right it's just something that's sort of subtle it's there and then later when the social engineer shows up at 2 p.m maybe maybe not the person just thinks back to that email right it's sort of oh yeah i, th I think i i read something about that or you know and then it makes it more likely that they're accepting it okay now um i i realize now that that's a persuasion tactic because you're trying to get access to the room uh not an elicitation uh, tactic so that example maybe should belong on the next slide but in any case the the, the idea of preloading overlaps uh, between elicitation and, and um, persuasion um, another thing that's actually very specific to elicitation is you can purposely misstate something okay so so like say you don't know an information so like I don't know say it's like a sales figure right so you're like well you know profits and loss last year were or whatever 30 million right and you actually what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that right number you have no idea what the right number is so you say something that's on, on purpose that, that that's wrong and it's kind of human nature for the person you're talking to to want to correct you and say oh no like actually you're wrong it wasn't 30 it was 15 or it was 60 or, or whatever the, whatever the correct information is okay so that's that's a, a way of sort of eliciting information without explicitly asking for it, okay? And um, yeah, a another thing you can do, or a social engineer will do is, is, um, is they'll try and demonstrate that they already know a lot. Uh, so for example, if it's sales figures or whatever, in this case, they'll, they'll state the right facts. And in this case, the, the person that's interacting, the victim, they'll think, oh, this person knows a lot about it. There's no way they would know this much unless if they like sort of, you know, are, are kind of in the inside circle of, of, of information. And so when they ask me about certain things and I really probably shouldn't be saying it to them, but because they know so much already, then it's probably safe. They probably already know what they're asking about or um, or, you know, they're other people trust them with this information. So I should trust them as well. Right. Um, so so in the information gathering stage. Um, and elicitation can also work like um, sequentially. So you might have one victim and the social engineer will elicit as much information as they can. Then they build up their knowledge database. Then they go to a second vi victim. They repeat the stuff that they elicited from the first victim in order to build a rapport and build trust with the second victim. And then they're maybe able to get a little more information and then they can sort of um, ratchet up uh, the amount of information. Okay. Um, okay. And then persuasion is like kind of trying to convince someone to do something that they, that, that they're not authorized to do. It breaks the rules in order for them to allow the attacker to, to do what the attacker is asking for. Okay. Um, so the attacker can use, uh, like the social engineer, you might use like emotional manipulation. Um, so it could be empathy like making you feel sorry for the social engineer. So they might say something like, um, you know, hi, I have a job interview. Uh, it's, you know, in 30 minutes and I'm just checking in for my job interview. You know, I, I had a really awful morning, you know, all these things went wrong and, you know, I don't know, my kids like did this and that, and I had to do this and I had to do that. And, you know, I just, I didn't have time to print off my CV. I really need it for the interview. Um, could you just do me a favor and, and just, I have it on a thumb drive. Could you could you just plug it in and, and print the PDF? It, it would be like a huge help uh, to me, right? And so you ask that 
and then I don't know the thumb drive has malware on it or something like that, and you know that's that's the attack vector. Okay, uh, it could be indebtedness as well. So like, um, you know, oh I I noticed you dropped this or oh I I noticed your boss is coming and and you know I see you on social media maybe you should close that and then after you do the favor then you're like okay maybe you could do me a favor like you don't make it that explicit um, like like. I scratch your back, you scratch mine, but it's it's that sort of uh, implication that that maybe the the target is more more willing to do you a favor if if the social engineer does does a favor for them. Um, another tactic that you'll learn over in the business school is uh, if if what you want is um, is like this is I I can't think of a great example off the top of my head, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a kind of dumb example, but. Like say I want access to the server room. So I could ask for more than what I want. So I could be like, hey, I, I'm here with my 10 friends. We all want to go in the server room. And they'll be like, oh, you're, you, know, you can't do that. And then you might say, well, maybe just I could go in. You know, like that's a very unrealistic scenario, right? But, but anyways, that, that's the idea, the general principle of, of you ask for more than you actually want. At, at the end of the day, you actually just want one person. So you, you think of how could I ask for something that's more then they can have something to say no to, and then we can sort of settle on what 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 you know what the social engineer actually wants. That's sort of the middle ground position. So there's a kind of negotiation that goes back and forth, and and it comes out where the social engineer wants it to come out. Um, other emotions can be manipulated. So fear, anger, coercion, anxiety. So this um, you know social engineers that are 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 doing this like I keep saying you like I sort of put you the audience in the shoes of the social engineer because I'm thinking of you as students that graduate that maybe become uh, penetration testers that are doing social engineering. Um, but anyways, if, if, if you've ever found yourself in a position uh, with that job, these are the kinds of things that might they're not against the law. You can go in and get angry at someone. It's not against the law, uh, but it it's unethical, right, um, to, to cause a lot of emotional distress, you know, distress in, in people. Uh, just because you're 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 pen testing the organization or whatever, so you know there's these are things that you would work out before you ever did the actual testing itself. Uh, you would have clear guidelines for for what you're able to do or not able to do. But in a real world scenario where you have a real attacker, then yeah, will they use fear, anger, coercion, anxiety? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that's the sort of theory. So that's the framework. Uh, it's useful for, for sort of classifying different social engineering attacks that we've seen and thinking about uh, how, how, how you might modify social engineering attacks and things like that. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you a handful of stories of social engineering that happened. And we can also use the framework as we go through them to think about how they line up with information gathering, pretexting, and uh, influence. Okay, so the first story has to do with RSA. Um, RSA you might know as a, you know, a, a crypto algorithm, uh, which it is. Uh, but the people who created the algorithm also started a security company. Um, I, I guess maybe initially it was about monetizing that encryption algorithm, but the the company soon evolved to to just doing anything in the whole security realm, and they're probably like maybe the number one biggest like security company in the world. Uh, they have a big conference. So probably one of the biggest security conferences in the world is this RSA conference that's sponsored by them. Uh, and and all, all the other companies go to RSA, like to the event space that they, they put up every year and they, you know, sell their, their products and, and things like that. And they have speakers and cryptographers talk and the original R and the S in RSA, you know, we'll, we'll get on stage every year and, and have like kind of a round table with some other cryptographers and it's kind of a fun event. Um, anyways, so this, this is RSA. Now, one of RSA's flagship products is a product that we already talked about uh, when we did the password alternatives uh, evaluation framework. And so it's this two-factor authentication. It looks like the key fob that's in the slide uh, so it's, you, you attach it to your key ring and it just has this random number. And when you log in, you put your username, you put your password, and then it will challenge you to put in the number that's appearing 
on the fob and, and you'll put it in and then uh, it will either let you in or not, depending on whether the number is correct or not. Okay. Now we can stop and think a bit about how does that work behind the scenes? Like how does you have some number on a fob? Well, how does the server decide whether that's right or wrong? So the way it works essentially is, uh, so this first is describing what I just said in Word. So you, you put your username password in, say you're logging into Concordia. Concordia themselves maintain just a straight password database. So they, they know my username and password or a hash of it. Um, and so they can say whether my password's right or not, but they don't necessarily know what's happening with my RSA token. So then what will happen is they'll ask me uh, what what's the number that's on the screen. I'll type it in. Um, and these devices work slightly differently. So uh, some of them just every 10 minutes or so, it displays a new number. So there's sort of a countdown and then it goes to the next one. Sometimes you press a button and then it gives you a fresh number. Uh, so there's different designs. It doesn't matter really for the purposes of anything. So we'll just assume that it, it's one of these ones that changes every 10 minutes. And the idea is that if you use a weak password and I guess your password as an adversary, then I would also have to get access to your token. And because your token is on your person, I would need physical access to you. So think of an attacker that's somewhere in another country, maybe another continent. Um, they could attack you. They could attack your account by trying to guess your password, right? And they wouldn't have to be, you know, in Montreal in order to do that attack. But the idea of this RSA token is, is that you're forcing the adversary to also have to like physically steal this thing off of you, uh, off of your person uh, in order to complete the authentication. Okay, so it doesn't, doesn't mean that it's impossible to break into the account, but it limits the number of adversaries to uh, adversaries that can access uh, something that you know and also something that you have, uh, which is this token. Okay, so there's different configurations. So Concordia might maintain their own database, but usually what happens is companies, they're paying RSA to buy all these tokens. And so RSA just sells them a service as well and says, hey, this is our specialty. We're, we're making these tokens. We know how they work. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll just ask the user for the number They'll pass it on to you. This should all happen over HTTPS. Um, so there's there's no problem here. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll pass it on to us. Okay. And in order for this all to work, you also have to register. So you have to know which user has which actual token. So so put it this way, if, if 10 people have a token, they're not all displaying the same number. So the, the token and the number that's being displayed is specific to that device. It's the only key fob that's going to have that exact number at that exact time. Um, and so every user has a different fob. So, so the fobs will have like a serial number or something like that. And so you'll register when you give this to Carol, uh, you'll register the fact that you gave her the fob with this serial number. You'll tell that to RSA and then they'll keep track of, of telling you whether the number that the user's typing in is actually correct or not. Okay, so how does RSA work? Uh, so what RSA will do is they'll have uh, a use a, a list of um, uh, of all the users that are registered. So I have them by name here, but it might be by serial number. And Concordia keeps track of of this username corresponds to the serial number, and maybe they send the serial number to RSA as opposed to the username. But it that, that's a small detail that doesn't matter. Okay, um, so what they have is they have a list of them. And for every fob, what happens cryptographically is there's a random number, which is a starting number. It's called a seed, okay? And you don't have to know the crypto details, but uh, this cryptographic seed, there's a, a cryptographic function called a pseudo random number generator. And what it does is it starts with the seed and it, it, it spits out random looking numbers. Okay, they're pseudo random because it's coming out of an algorithm, but they look random. Okay, but technically they're not random. And if you start the pseudo random number generator with the same seed, you'll get the same sequence of numbers. If you change the seed, even if it's just a small thing, like just a single bit different in the seed, you'll get a completely different stream of random numbers. Okay, so every user has this seed that's recorded and then there's an algorithm and the algorithm will expand this seed into the random numbers. And that's what's being shown on the actual fob itself, okay? So the seed actually exists in two places. 
So the fob itself has the key, or sorry, the seed inside of it, and it has it like in hardware, like in the circuit uh, of the fob itself. The, the seed is in there, and it's running the pseudo random number generator and then displaying the output on the screen. And then RSA, the company, they also have a copy of the seed in this uh, file called the seed warehouse, and they were storing it on one server. Uh, and uh, it also has the seed, and then they also know the algorithm. So what they can do is they can, uh, the other thing you can do is you can fast forward in time. So you don't have to generate it every 10 minutes. If you want to just jump to like, hey, given this seed, what would be the thing that's displayed one year later? You can just jump quickly to it algorithmically. Okay, so they, um, but, but anyways, with the seed, they're able to generate the same stream of random numbers. Once they have the stream of random numbers, then they can uh, look at the clock, figure out what time it is relative to when they started this. So like when, when they give the fob, when they manufacture the fob, what they'll do is they'll put the seed in and then they'll start the timer and then every 10 minutes it will increment. And so what they'll write down here is this was the seed. This is like the time, the, the wall clock time of when we turned this on and it started running. And, uh, and so then what they'll do is they'll, they'll generate the full stream and then they'll jump ahead in 10 minute increments into the current time. And then they'll figure out what the current random number is. Okay. And it's sort of tolerant to slippage. So like if you enter a number that's from 10 minutes ago or, or even 20 or 30 minutes ago, uh, the server will, will kind of look around this, this number in the stream and see, you know, if, if, if it doesn't match exactly, it will say, well, maybe the clocks are, are slightly off and out, out of sync. Um, and so they'll look to see if it's a nearby random number. And if it's nearby, it will still accept it as authentication. And then it will adjust its internal clock uh, to, to try and resynchronize uh, with it. Okay. All right. So this, this basically is, is, is how this works. Okay. Now, the seed file, first off, is highly sensitive. Okay. If you have the seed file for all the users, you have the... Um, you have the equivalent of the fob itself. So let's go back to the motivating example. The motivating example is you have an adversary. They're not in Montreal. They're somewhere else in the world. They might be able to steal your password, okay? But they're not going to be able to steal this fob because this fob is physically on your body, uh, unless that they're here, okay? But if they're able to steal this file, this file is equivalent to the fob. They can generate what's on the fob based on what's inside the file, okay? And so if they're able to steal this file, then they can attack you. And stealing this file is a question of breaking into a server. And, you know, you can do that from another country in the world, right? You can do that over the internet. And you might say, well, this server, it, it must be highly sensitive. It's probably air gapped and things like that. But think about it. Concordia gets a number. They send it to RSA. RSA has to figure out whether that number is correct or not and tell Concordia, yes, Yes, it's right or no, it's wrong. And it has to do it in basically real time. And so what that means is that you can't have this file sitting in a safe, printed out on a piece of paper offline. It needs to be in the server, which is online, that's responding to, to you know millions of these requests every second. Uh, and so it, it, it needs it at its fingertips. So it's gotta be loaded into RAM and it's looking at this file. Um, so it, it can't be on some air gapped computer. Okay, for this whole system to work. Okay, so anyways, so the uh, so let's say that this code is correct. We 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 take the seed, we expand it by a year because it's a year after the thing was manufactured. Uh, the algorithm tells us that this is what should be displayed. What the user typed in and was passed on to us matches what we determined should be displayed at this time. And so then we say yes. Uh, authenticate them, and then Concordia passes that on to the user, and now they've logged in, and they're they're successfully in. Okay, so this uh, file is sensitive because it basically has every RSA token in the world in a single file, uh, and it's hot in the sense of having to be on an online server. Like it, the server needs access to it, it's using it on a second by second basis. It's not cold as in it could be put into cold storage where, where you only have to look at it once a year or something like that. Okay, so what happened? So what happened is uh, for RSA the company is 
that uh, somehow this file that's very sensitive got stolen. So someone was able to breach uh, the server, the, the seed warehouse, and they were able to actually steal, uh, to steal the file. And RSA realized that, that, you know, these tokens are no longer secure. And so we have to notify the public about it. Uh, so they notified it. And part of like this happens, I, I forget what year it happened in, but um, now two-factor authentication is, is relatively common, although we tend to use our phones or, or other things rather than these fobs. But at the time, two-factor wasn't very common. And in fact, the, the kinds of companies that would use two-factor were ones that were very sensitive. Um, so like a lot of U.S. government, U.S. military, or other kinds of companies that had really high security um, uh, profiles, they, they were the ones that would tend to use these RSA fobs anyway. So the fact that those were the companies that were breached uh, was, was, was significant uh, because they, you know, they, they were often protecting like information that, that was highly classified or, or highly sensitive uh, information. Okay. And so what this means is you still have the password that protects it. So the, the, the adversary just can't log into everything now that they stole this file. But what you've done is you've reduced the second factor of authentication and you've reduced it down to just one. You've taken out completely that second factor of authentication. Now you just have usernames and passwords that are protecting uh, the information. Okay, and, and so anyways, in the open letter uh, that they wrote, they also wrote a bit about how it happened, which was interesting, okay? Um, so, so how is it that this like biggest security company in the world, uh, most sensitive like service server probably within the company, how was it that it got breached, okay? And so it's sort of a long story that involves some technical attacks and not all the details are spilled out. Um, but what was interesting to me and the reason I'm bringing up in this lecture is it actually all started with a social engineering attack. So that was the first toehold that the adversary had into the system. And then they were able to, 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 to move around laterally within the system and compromise the server. Um, so the social engineering attack worked with um, it worked through spear phishing. So I mentioned this earlier. So spear phishing is where. It's not just a fake email um, that's kind of generic that you might send the same email to a million people and hope that some, you know, you get a hundred of them that click on it. Uh, this is an email that's crafted very specifically for a very specific target. And every small detail that you try and get, you try and get right uh, in terms of the email, which increases the probability that they would click on it. And you have to believe at a company, I think it was in the story itself, that there is a general policy that you don't open attachments in emails. Um, so this person, um, you had to make the, the recipient of the email very comfortable with the idea of a breaching policy in order to, to open the attachment uh, because they felt safe uh, with it. So what the email looked like, we actually have a copy of. So it looked like this. Um, uh, so it, uh, it was sent to someone within the company. Uh, they worked within HR, within the HR department. There was other company, uh, individuals that were in CC and these people all worked together. So like, it would be very, very common, uh, for, uh, for like an email that circulated to, to say the, the recipient for these other people to be in CC, okay? So this is information that the adversary had, the social engineer was able to gather through information gathering, and they were able to, to make this email look more right by having a, a sensible set of recipients for it. Now it does come from a weird kind of phishing looking domain. So, you know, this isn't, so EMC is the parent company of RSA. So this isn't coming from within their same domain. Okay, so it's, it's, it is an outside email. But if you're looking at it really quickly and you just sort of see uh, who it's sent to, who's in CC, that all looks fine. Uh, recruitment plan sounds like, you know, sounds like the kind of document that, that might get circulated amongst a bunch of people that work in HR. Okay, uh, and then it's just, you know, I, I forward this to you, please open it. And atta there's an attachment and it's uh, uh, labeled 2011 recruitment plan dot XLS. Okay. And so it just takes one person of 
the people that are CC'd on this uh, in order to, to click on this, uh, that, that, that was the adversary's goal. Okay, so um, anyway, so we, we know that at, uh, at least one of them uh, clicked on it, or at least that's, that's suspected as, as the attack vector. Okay, now notice that, that because this uh, came from an outside domain, the common practice today is to, to warn users of all emails that come from outside of the domain. And you can, to some extent, spoof emails too. So you could actually send an email that looks like it comes from emc.com, but there's some cryptographic protections that aren't always used uh, called DKIM. So it could have stopped that um, that kind of spoofing as, as well. So so anyway, so the, 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 it was sort of, I mean, the victim could have done better uh, with this email because there, there was a hint in this from line, okay? But uh, the rest of the email looks very sensible and it looks like something, it doesn't look like some generic like kind of phishing email that you normally see. Okay, uh, so the, the file itself. Now, what kind of file is this? Okay, so this is an XLS file. So what program is XLS? You probably know the answer to that, it's Excel, okay? Now, is an Excel file like okay to open? Like even if you don't trust the person that gave it to you and you're like, oh, maybe the, maybe it's malicious or there's malware in it, does it matter? Because it's just data anyways. It's not like an executable file, right? You open it, your spreadsheet displays some data and then that's it, okay? And so the answer to that question is, is that actually Excel files are, are dangerous because Excel's like one of those, it's software that kind of, you know, became more and more powerful over time and Microsoft kept adding new features to it. And so somewhere along the line, they decided, hey, it'd be really cool if you could run what's called Adobe Flash. We don't really use that anymore. Um, but if, if you could run this Adobe Flash within Excel, uh, which is a scripting language, uh, then, then you could do fancy things uh, with your spreadsheet, okay? Uh, and so they added the feature, probably not a lot of people actually used it, but it was always kind of there uh, in Excel. Uh, the adversaries noticed it and they noticed that there was a, a, a implementation flaw, not in Excel itself, but in Flash, okay? And this was a high profile attack. And so the attack that they found in Flash wasn't an attack that someone else had found and they're just using it, it was an attack that they themselves had come up with. Uh, no one knew the attack was there until this email started circulating. Um, so we call that a zero day because there's no prior indication of, of knowing about the vulnerability. So they they came up with the vulnerability themselves uh, and nobody knew about it. So Flash wasn't patched and Excel had it patched uh, to the extent that, that, that Excel could do something about it. Um, so, so anyway, so the, the vulnerability was in Flash. Flash was running in Excel. And then this, um, this file had uh, the vulnerability, okay? So someone looked at the email, they, they, they looked, you know, at least surface level at it. They decided it looked okay. They clicked on the link. Uh, when you actually click on the link, this is what happens. We, we have a video of it. So in this case, they're, they're gonna actually click the file. So you get a brief warning, but that's sort of a standard warning that you always get on all email, all emails, anytime you wanna open an attachment. So this is the, the, the standard one. And then when you open it, it's gonna open Excel. The Excel sheet itself was blank. Okay, and it just had this weird like kind of symbol in, you can see in A1, there's this weird thing and that's the embedded script. And by this time it's too late. So even if you're like, this is a weird spreadsheet and you close it, it's, it's too late, right? The exploit, your, your computer now has malware on it. Um, so that's, that's it, that's all it, that's all it took. Okay, so the adversary was able to get this one employee's computer uh, compromised or breached. Uh, and because it was uh, in the HR department, apparently this computer had uh, some files that had login credentials and things like that for, for other employees uh, within the company. And so they, those, those got stolen as well. And then the adversary was able to kind of move uh, from that computer to other computers. 
And we don't know a lot, like the, the, the details aren't fully spelled out, but essentially they were able to eventually move uh, throughout the company's network. And eventually they reached the server that had the database of the seeds, uh, the seed warehouse uh, for, for all these secure ID RSA tokens. Now, another interesting aspect of this attack is, okay, now you're on the server and you have the file, right? You're, you, you've compromised the computer that has the file, but you need to export that file somewhere. You've got to move it off of the network onto an adversarially controlled machine, right? But in order to do that, you need to, for example, let's say you just open an internet socket to the adversary does this uh, to, to, to a machine that they control and they start pumping data out, right? There's, there's a chance, I mean, networks have intrusion detection systems and other things like that. And so this, this would be anomalous behavior, right? It would be unusual. And so that's the kind of thing that would get flagged. And so there's a chance that, you know, they might be able to, to move some of the credentials out, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they uh, you know, they, they, they might get caught, you know, half, you know, part way through or something like that. And so they not, the, they might not be able to get all of them. Um, and so, uh, what the adversary did is they sort of disguised the traffic, uh, in, and tried to make it look kind of benign. They, they took the time exfiltrating the data. So, so it took about nine hours. Uh, they sent it to Rackspace. Rackspace is, uh, is, is a major corporation. If Rackspace knew it was being used by malicious actors, they also would have shut it down. Um, and so it's sort of risky, but then uh, it, it also, uh, the traffic looks more benign because it's it's going somewhere where, where you know, probably traffic from RSA goes anyways. Um, so anyway, so, so it, they were able to steal uh, the entire seed warehouse. And so essentially all RSA tokens with the exception of companies that run their own server uh, they were compromised, uh, so they no longer uh, worked. Um, oh, and uh, I, I forgot this detail, but apparently, even if you did host the server yourself, uh, you had the option of, of having a backup uh, with RSA, just in case something happened to your server. Let's say there was a natural disaster or something like that, and, and you lost your server, and then all of a sudden all your tokens don't work. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, I correct myself and say that uh, it turns out that all, basically all RSA key fobs were, um, were compromised. And so they decided, well, we have to go public with this information and we'll of course replace all the RSA tokens for free. Uh, but you know, there's, there was something like 40 million, uh, of these tokens, uh, in circulation and they didn't have 40 million of these tokens lying around right, to, to, to just replace them all. And so they had to, you know, they had to manufacture new ones and things like that. And so it, it was a big deal. It wasn't just a quick fix. Like, um, so it ended up being very costly, I'm sure for, for RSA, the company. They did survive uh, the, the, this and people still use RSA tokens today and they still run the RSA conference every year. Okay, uh, story number two. So this concerns uh, this guy, uh, Matt Honan, who is a reporter, freelance reporter, he, he writes for uh, different magazines, including Wired Magazine. And so we know this story because he wrote about it. Uh, he wrote a whole article about it uh, for, for Wired. Uh, okay, so uh, Matt Honan was a Twitter user and he had uh, uh, his Twitter handle was at Matt. MAT. And it turns out, uh, especially in the earlier days of Twitter, when they had strict character uh, limits, uh, if you have a short username, it's it's handy uh, because it doesn't contribute as much to the character limits. And it's just seen as sort of desirable, right? It's kind of like having a fancy car or something like that. Like it's a, it's a sought after item uh, to have a short uh, username. Okay. And so this attack was all about the the adversary trying to steal this handle. The adversary wanted to get control of this handle and, and, and take it for themselves. So uh, what they did is, well, think about it for yourself. What, what would you do? So you 
uh, you see this handle, uh, you want to get access to it. Um, you know, you can try and log in. Uh, there's going to be a username and a password. Presumably, uh, the adversary is not going to know the password. Okay, so then, then what do you do? And so the answer is, well, you would probably try to do a password reset, right? You'd say, I'm Matt Honan. I forgot my password. Can you give me a new one? And so that's exactly what uh, the adversary started off by doing. And, uh, and so uh, the way that Twitter works for password recovery at this time uh, is if you had an email address uh, that you used to register it uh, and uh, you, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so, so you, when you sign up for Twitter, you sign up with an email and so, so it's just gonna send the password reset to your email, okay? So uh, Matt had a Gmail account uh, and so that was his recovery email that was set. Uh, it was easily discoverable what this actual Gmail address was, but the adversary doesn't have access to the Gmail account either. Okay, so what are they going to do? They're going to do the exact same thing, right? So they'll go over to Google and they'll say, hi, I'm so-and-so at gmail.com. I forgot my password, right? So what Google does is they also have some sort of password reset policy. And so their policy is, is actually the same. Uh, so their policy is, hey, maybe you have a second email account. Uh, you can leave that in your Gmail account uh, and that will be used for recovering your password. So Matt Honan, so, so basically the error message came back and said, uh, or it wasn't an error message, just a message, but it, it, it came back saying, okay, we, we sent the password reset to your email address at me.com. Now, does anyone know what me.com is? Right, you probably, I'm guessing that, that most of you probably don't know. Uh, so this was Apple's short-lived attempt at trying to do a Twitter or a Facebook kind of product. Uh, it was kind of like a social networking product. Uh, it was, uh, it didn't catch on with users and, and so, so it doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, but, but anyways, uh, so it's, it's an Apple uh, product. Okay, so the adversary again doesn't know the Apple password for this me email address either. Uh, and so they're, but they can do the same trick anyway. So they'll, they'll go to Apple and they'll, they'll say, hi, I forgot my password. I'd like to reset it. Okay. Now there's one difference between Apple, Google, and Twitter, at least at this point in time, uh, Google and Twitter didn't really have, you know, the need for customer service and they weren't, uh, they, they didn't have a lot of products that, that required payment. Okay. Apple did. They had iTunes and your Apple account was sort of unified. So, so your, your me email account and your Apple t iTunes password and all that kind of stuff, they were all kind of linked together. So Apple was like, um, they were a commercial, like they, they were selling things online. I know Google does now, especially with Android and, and the Play Store and things like that. And Twitter has like paid versions of Twitter now. Uh, but Apple was sort of set up differently where uh, because they moved more in the e-commerce direction, they felt it was important to have a phone line and like real human beings that you could you could go talk to if you if you have issues. OK, so uh, and, and they also had credit card information and financial information and that type of stuff on record uh, for people. So what happened is the adversary went to Apple and they said, I want to reset my password. Uh, and Apple said, OK, great. Uh, this is what we need from you. We need your username. We need the address that's associated with the credit card that we have on file with you. And we need the last four digits of your credit card. If you can give us that piece of information, those pieces of information, then uh, we'll reset your password for you. Okay, so the adversary knew the username because Google said where it sent the email to, or at least it was easily discoverable. Um, because Matt Honan also had a personal website, there is a directory of everybody that owns a website called who is now it's common practice that you anonymize your who is record uh, you pay a little bit extra when you register a domain and there's there's a company i think it's called privacy guard or something like that and it, it will register it under its own name instead of registering it under your name um, but but for a long time basically anyone who owned a website had to fill in a form with their name and their their real world address and so uh, the adversary was able to get this information from 
uh, the Who Is record per Matt Honan, Honan's website. So he, the adversary knew the, the billing address. The last four digits of the credit card, however, the adversary didn't know. Okay, so now the adversary is stuck, right? They can't, without those four digits, they can't reset Apple and without getting into the Apple email, they can't reset Gmail and without getting into the Gmail account, they can't reset Twitter. So what they decided to do is kind of like the same attack, but uh, they, they went around to other web services that Matt Honan may or may not have had accounts with, okay? So they went over to Amazon and they said, okay, we're, we'll, we'll try Amazon. Now, Amazon, like Apple, I mean, more even to a greater degree than Apple is an e-commerce site, okay? So Amazon has like phone numbers and things like that that you can call uh, if you have help. So the adversary switched over to the phone and uh, said, you know, I'd like to, I lost my password. Uh, I'd like to reset it. And the person on the other line of the phone basically said the same thing that Apple said. They said, you know, what's your username? Uh, what's your billing address and what's the last four digits of your credit card? Okay, so the adversary doesn't have the last four digits of the credit card. That's why they're they're trying to go uh, to Amazon. The idea was that if they could somehow get logged into Amazon, then that credit card information would be saved and then they would be able to see what the, the, the four digits were. Okay, so anyway, so so they, they, they're kind of at a standstill uh, and maybe they tried other services, but they sort of got nowhere. It, it always came down to them not having access to the right email accounts or not having access to the last four digits of the credit card. Okay, now this is where um, the attack takes a kind of ingenious <laughs> turn. Um, so what the adversary decides to do is they hang up with Amazon and then they call Amazon back. And this time they have a different story, right? They say, hi, I'm Matt Honan. Um, I have a new credit card and I want to add it to my account. And so Amazon says, you know what, that, that's great. Uh, you know, we, we, we love, love when people add credit cards, right? That means they're going to buy stuff with us. And, and so that's something that, that we're not going to give you a lot of difficulty. If you phone up asking for your, your resetting your password, we're really scared that, that you're not the person that you say you are and, and we're going to give you a hard time about it. But if you call up just saying, I want to add a new credit card, right? Then that's great. We'll, we'll take that information. Um, and so they basically just add some basic account information to authenticate the caller. Uh, they didn't fully authenticate them. So they didn't require that they knew other information beyond that. So it was successful. So the adversary uh, was able to add their own credit card uh, to Amazon. Now this seems like kind of a weird attack. Like why would you add your own credit card to Amazon, right? It doesn't seem like it's going to, going to do much, right? But then what they do is, so they hang up and then they call back again and they say, hi, I'm Matt Honan, I forgot my password. Okay, so Amazon says, well, we need your username, we need your billing address, and we need the last four digits of your credit card. So the adversary, as we've established, knows the username, they know the billing address. Uh, they don't know the last four digits of the credit card, but because they just added a new credit card, they do know the last four digits of the second credit card. And that second credit card, I mean, there's no distinction. It's, it's in the account just like the other credit card. So they say what the last four digits of the second credit card is. And Amazon says, great, you must be Matt Honan. Uh, we're going to reset your password. And, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, set it to whatever you want. So then the adversary logs in and... Uh, they they look through the uh, the, the account uh, and they see that there's a manage uh, credit cards like screen where it has all the credit cards that were added to the account. Now, helpfully, Amazon doesn't display the number; it stars them out, but it leaves the last four digits visible uh, so that that uh, you can recognize which credit card is which credit card. Okay, so they're able to see not just the credit card that they added, but they're able to see the last four digits of the original credit card. Then they sort of go backwards uh, through this process. And so now they know the last four digits of the original credit card. Uh, and so they're able to reset the Apple password. They're able to get access to the me email account. Uh, there's an email waiting for them to reset the password for Google. Uh, so they reset the password for Google. Now they have access to the Gmail account. And inside the Gmail account, uh, there's a, a password that's uh, 
or sorry, there's an email sitting there that's about resetting the Twitter password. And so they are able to reset the Twitter password and they're able to achieve their goal of, of taking over uh, at Matt, uh, the Twitter account. Okay, now I wish this was the end of the story, right? Um, but it turns out that it was actually a little worse uh, than, than what I've depicted, depicted. So as the adversary kind of moved from these accounts, they decided that they wanted to uh, kind of remove all traces of themselves doing it. And so what they did is they decided to delete things as they went through. So for example, uh, when they got access to Gmail, they deleted all the email uh, that was in the Gmail account. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I have so much information in my old emails. Uh, and, you know, this guy's a reporter, a journalist, and so all his contacts and drafts of stories that he's working on and, and all of that stuff is, is just gone. Okay, but it gets worse. Uh, at a certain point, Matt Honan, sort of in the middle of the attack, he started realizing that things were weird. And the reason he realized it was weird is he was looking at his phone and he picked it up and it was completely blank. Wouldn't turn on or when it turned on, it would just go to the welcome screen uh, as if it was a brand new phone out of the box. And so uh, what had happened is Apple had enabled this feature called Find My iPhone. So if you ever lose your iPhone, you can, you can if it has GPS, which all phones do, or if it's on Wi-Fi, uh, it will try and locate it for you. And if you're concerned that your phone is lost, there's an option to remotely wipe it. So you can press a button and then it will wipe the phone uh, completely. And so that happened. Uh, and so the adversary, when they were able to reset the Apple account to get access to the me account, they also decided to, to, to wipe uh, his phone completely. So it, all the contacts on his phone, photos, you know, what, what, whatever you have on your phone, maybe to some extent it was saved in iCloud, but basically that stuff was all, was all gone. Now for a short period of time, Apple, they really liked this remote wipe feature. They thought it was a great security feature. Uh, and so not only did they enable it on phones, but they enabled it on laptops too. And so the adversary uh, also, in addition to wiping his phone, wiped his laptop uh, completely. And so this is where he really lost a lot of data. So, you know, he had all, all think of all the files and, you know, the work stuff that you're doing, you know, old tax documents, uh, all that kind of stuff, personal stuff like pictures. So all his wedding pictures were, were on his laptop. They're now gone. Right. He had all these pictures of his kids as they were growing up, up, they're all gone. Right. All because the adversary wanted this Twitter handle. And what did the adversary do with the Twitter handle? Not much. I mean, they put on some like ad advertisements and things like that for people to click on. And, and that was it. OK, so his digital life basically got wiped out um, just just over this Twitter handle. Now, uh, I should mention, how do we know all of this? Um, and so Matt Honan uh, had, uh, when, when the Twitter account got taken over, he created a new Twitter account and then messaged uh, his old account. And the person was, able, was, was willing to talk. And they said, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how I did the attack. And you can write it down and write a story about it. And then, and then other people will, you know, will, will take better measures to protect themselves. But what's the real problem here? In my, in my mind, the real problem is, is Amazon, right? The, the idea that they would add a credit card uh, without authenticating the person adding the credit card, that was the oversight in the policy, the security policy of Amazon that created this, this whole attack in the first place. Um, and so because this ended up on like the cover page of Wired Magazine, it was very high profile. And as a result of this, incident, uh, lots of policies were changed. So Amazon immediately changed their policy and people started reevaluating how they, they reset passwords and things like that. Okay, this is a very, very similar uh, story. Uh, so this is another story about someone that had a short Twitter handle uh, at N. So this is a single character. Uh, he said that, that people had offered him $50,000 for it, but he didn't want to sell it. Uh, so this is there. There is a value for 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 this kind of thing, okay. So this story starts the exact same way as at Matt. Uh, the adversary goes and they 
say, hi, I forgot my password. Can you reset it? And Twitter says, no problem. We'll send an email to your email account. Okay. But the difference here is that the email was a custom domain. So instead of using Gmail, uh, they had a custom domain set up, you know, n.com or whatever. Uh, and, and that's where the email was going. Okay, now we, we talked a little bit, uh, you'll recall when we talked about uh, SSL, TLS and certificate authorities and how do you figure out whether someone actually owns a domain or not? Well, you can send an email to them and if they can respond, um, you know, that then you'll accept that they own the domain. And we pointed out that there's all sorts of attacks that are possible uh, with that type of thing. And so those types of attacks are, are also applicable here. Um, so in order to figure out um, well, first, first off, uh, so the adversary wanted to figure out, okay, who's the domain registrar for this? So they went to who is and who is said, okay, it was registered through GoDaddy. And so then they said, okay, great. We'll go over to GoDaddy and we'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll sort of say, I forgot my password and we'll see where we get. Okay. And this is where the story also takes a, a, a slightly different turn. So in the at Matt story, it's still social engineering because the adversary is pretending to be someone they're not. Okay, so there is that pretext there. Okay, but it's not like a super strong pretext uh, because it's they're they're mostly like just you know there was a phone call I guess, but a lot of it's just using web interfaces and things like that. Okay, uh, but in this case, uh, the adversary decided to uh, use very strong uh, social engineering. Okay. Um, so I actually, I, I should correct myself. I guess first off they said, uh, they just did the password reset and then uh, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, what's the username? They knew it. What's the billing address? They could get it from who is. And this time they want six digits instead of four digits and they didn't have it, okay? So then what they decided to do was, was, was a stronger social engineering attack. And so they called GoDaddy, but, um, oh, sorry, I, I, I'm getting my story mixed up here, okay. Uh, so GoDaddy, they kind of struck out, okay? Then they decided, okay, let's go to a different company and try it. Someone else that might have credit card information on on, on hand. Uh, so th they went over to PayPal and they knew the account name and the username uh, for the login for PayPal. They didn't know the password and they didn't know the, the last four digits of the credit card. But, okay, so as I was saying, now they're, they're going to do a proper social engineering attack. So what they did is they called PayPal, but instead of saying, oh, I'm... I forgot my password. What they said is, I'm I work at PayPal, right? I am in a different division, and they had some story, and I don't think the details of the story were, were outlined. Um, again, we know the details of the story because there was a conversation uh, between the victim and the the attacker. Um, but the uh, but the pretext here was was that they were another employee of PayPal, and so they had some reason like maybe IT reason or something like that for, for why they needed uh, the last four digits of the account, but they couldn't get uh, it. They didn't have access to it. And so uh, the other employee fell for it and they uh, gave them uh, the four digits. Okay, so now they have the last four digits. And so they go back to GoDaddy. They say, you know, I lost, I lost my... Um, uh, oh, sorry, they say, I want to reset my password. So they, they say, okay, great. What's your username? What's your billing address? Uh, what's the last six digits of your credit card? And so then uh, the person, and this is on the phone. And so they say, you know what? I, I lost that credit card. I don't have it anymore. I do have the last four digits written down uh, because I, I, you know, I, it's in another account or something like that. Like that basically proves that I, I know who I am, that, that I have this credit card. Like, can, can you just you know, can you just let me reset it with four digits instead of six? And uh, the person on the other line of the phone said, you know, I, I believe you, but I, I literally can't. Like, like I have this computer system and if I do not put the six digits in, it won't issue the link in order for you to reset it. So like, it, I, can't, I can't override the system. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm locked out of the system. Uh, but what I'll do for you is I will, uh, I'll help you guess those last two digits, right? So they, they were literally like, I guess my understanding is they were like zero, zero, and then the actual four digits, zero, one, the last four digits, zero, two, the last four digits. And eventually after something like 10 tries, they were able to find the, those missing two digits and then the password was reset. Now, if 
the social engineer wasn't so convincing on the phone, right? There is another path forward, which is just that you make a hundred phone calls, right? You, you call up the first time and you say the last six digits are zero, zero, blah, blah, blah. And then if it doesn't work, you hang up, you know, you probably get two or three tries before the, the person sort of stops letting you try. Uh, then you, you sort of hang up and you call back and usually these call centers are big, so you're probably not going to get the same person. Uh, and then you can try a couple more and you can maybe spread it out over a couple days. And as long as there's no flag that's sort of put on that account that someone's trying this a lot, uh, you, you, could, you could easily find those last two digits. But in this case, none of that was needed. Okay, so with the last six digits, they had uh, access and then it was the same thing. They... Um, they were able to reset uh, the, the GoDaddy password. Then they were able to access the GoDaddy account. Then they were able to change the DNS record. Okay, so what they did is they changed the MX server, which is the mail server for that domain. And uh, they changed it, the adversary changed it to a domain that they control or to an IP address that they control. Okay, so now when the Twitter email uh, is is uh, sent the reset email it will get sent to the adversary as opposed to the the actual server uh, that was was uh, accepting the email before okay now there's only one problem with this uh, which is that DNS doesn't update instantly it's kind of a distributed system there's all these DNS servers all over the world and so when you change it in GoDaddy it takes a while for that information to propagate so it could take up to three days uh, for example, to, to, to reach all the servers and reaching Twitter is, is the main thing that, that needs to happen so that Twitter sends the password to the new MX records server as opposed to the old one. OK, and because it had an update dated, the email was still active. OK, so the victim realized, oh, I uh, I um, uh, I this this reset happened. Right. He got an email basically saying that, that, oh, we, you know, just letting you know that your registrar entry was was changed. And this was actually right after the other story. And it had been, you know, in Wired magazine and things like that. And so he knew this, the other story. And he said, OK, I know what's happening here. They want my Twitter account. And so he went and he changed the email on his Twitter account uh, to, to something like Gmail or something like that. And so now even when the MX record changes, uh, the adversary is not going to get the, the Twitter uh, account, okay? Then I can't remember exactly what happened, but basically a, a sort of communication channel opened uh, between the two of them and they started talking. Uh, and the thing is that like, even though the adversary is not going to get the Twitter account in the end, they are still going to get all the email that's being sent to this person to the victim, right, uh, at end. And so all of that email, you know, and then who knows what the adversary is going to do with that email, right? They could send back other stuff or, you know what I mean? And so the person was like, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth losing all my email and, and having it go to an attacker who's mad at me because I won't give them my Twitter handle, right? And so they reach a kind of deal where, uh, uh, where he would surrender the Twitter account if, the adversary would reset the, the GoDaddy back to the way it was. Uh, and so that was the sort of negotiation uh, that they had. Okay, so here's another story. So this story is kind of more local. Uh, so this actually happened in Ottawa, which is about an hour and a half from here. And uh, it concerns uh, an exchange service for a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. So you probably have heard of Bitcoin in the, in the news. Uh, I work a lot on, on the technology that underlies things like Bitcoin. It's one of my research areas. But anyways, uh, what an exchange service is, it's, it's where you, let's say you have some Bitcoin and you want to turn it into Canadian dollars. Or conversely, let's say that you have some Canadian dollars and you want to buy some Bitcoin with it. You'll go to a website like Coinbase. Uh, this story doesn't concern Coinbase itself. This is just a general example. Um, and... Uh, and they offer an exchange service, okay? So the idea is that you would transfer your Bitcoin to Coinbase themselves, okay? Coinbase would have a Bitcoin account. So now your account is like mixed in with all of other 
Coinbase's customers. And then what they have is they just have like a internal spreadsheet that, that you know, it's more rigorous than that, but they have like an internal database that maintains what the internal balances are uh, for all of their users, okay? But the point is that if you want to change your Bitcoin into Canadian dollars, you have to give possession of your Canadian dollars to Coinbase. It's kind of like a bank. Like if you put money in the bank, it's it's not in your pocket anymore. If the bank disappeared with your money, your, your money's gone, right? And so you, you have to give, you have to actually give your Bitcoin to it. And what does it mean to own Bitcoin? Uh, so Bitcoin uses cryptography and so they use digital signatures. And so the person who owns Bitcoin is effectively the person who can sign a transaction. So we, we talked about digital signatures a lot. So there's this sort of public key. And so what Bitcoin does is it maintains also kind of like a big database that says, here's a bunch of public keys and here's how much Bitcoin they own. And if you want to send Bitcoin from one person to another, uh, what you do is you just uh, sign a message using the private key that's associated, the signing key that's associated with that public key. And then the Bitcoin network will check that that digital signature is correct. And then they'll say, OK, you you're allowed to send that money uh, because you, you have the proper digital signature. Uh, and then Canadian dollars work kind of the same way. Uh, so if you want to move one hundred dollars into the um, exchange, you actually give the money to them. So you use Interact or a wire transfer or something like that. You would uh, give the the, um, the Canadian dollar. So it's now in the possession of the exchange. The exchange will add your account uh, to the, um, you know, to, to their database of, of people that, that have Canadian dollars and, and keep track of it. Then let's say you want to do an exchange. So Alice wants to sell 0 0.001 Bitcoin for $100, okay? And so she kind of puts, she registers that offer in what's called an order book. Uh, and then Bob comes along and says, oh, I see that somebody is willing to, uh, is, is, is willing to sell their Bitcoin uh, for $100. I actually have $100. It's on the exchange. And so, and I want Bitcoin. So I'll, I'll buy that. That That's a good deal. That looks like a good deal for me. So I'll, I'll buy that. Okay. And so then what happens is the, um, the money doesn't actually move, right? Because all the money, both the Bitcoin and the Canadian dollars are sitting on the exchange. Okay. So there's no need for any actual payments to happen, but what the exchange does is they just update their internal, uh, database and say, okay, Alice, now, instead of having 0 0.001 Bitcoin, she has $100, and Bob, instead of having $100, has 0 0.01 Bitcoin. Then, at any time, you can withdraw uh, from it, okay? So, uh, Bob could say, hey, I, I want my Bitcoin back, and Coinbase will say, okay, give us an address, give us, which is a public key, and we'll send it uh, to the address, and then after it's sent and it's you know finalized on the blockchain, then they'll zero out uh, Bob's account in their internal uh, database and say, okay, Bob doesn't have any Bitcoin anymore. And in order to do this, I should mention, they have to use their own key. So they, uh, because it was sitting in their account, now they have to sign the transaction that moves it from their account to Bob, okay? So they're gonna use uh, their actual key in order to do that transaction. And so what that means is that their key needs to be, and that, that transaction is sent to the internet and everyone expects that it's gonna happen in seconds. You know, it's not gonna be like, okay, we'll send it tomorrow. It's not like traditional banking, okay? And so what that means is that key to sign the transaction that belongs to the exchange, it has to be on a server that's connected to the internet in order for this to work efficiently. Okay, so we call it a hot, uh, file or hot wallet. Uh, wallet is, is the term that's used to, to represent the file that stores a key. Um, but, but, but the main thing is that, that it, it needs to be there. Now, if you could break into the server and steal the key, then you're going to steal all the exchange's money. Okay, so that key is, is both super sensitive, uh, but it also can't be, it can't be like locked up in a safe. Right. It has to be sort of present because people are withdrawing all the time and you need to be able to sign things. OK, so what exchanges do is they take all the Bitcoin that they hold and they sort of split it where they, they'll keep about five percent of their Bitcoin uh, under one key, a key that's on a server. So in a, they call it a hot wallet. And then they'll take, you know, 90, 95 percent 
of their holdings and they'll put it on a computer that's completely offline or they'll put it on a USB, like a thumb drive kind of device called a hardware wallet. <laughs> and they, you know, that could actually go into a safe or <coughs> there's ways to set it up so that, you know, there might be 10 people that have these things and, you know, you need any seven of them in order to come together and, and move money from the cold wallet to wherever it's going, usually to the hot wallet. <coughs> okay, so, but, but the point is that um, for any exchange that's in operation, there is some substantial amount of money that's sitting on a server. And if you can break into the server, you can steal, you can steal the Bitcoin, okay? Um, the other thing I should mention is that you might think that people, you know, they move their Bitcoin onto the exchange, they do their trade, and then they move it off right away and they try and keep it on the exchange for the least amount of time possible because if the exchange gets attacked or something like that, then their money's gone, right? So it's risky to use a, an exchange. But the actually, the exact opposite is true. A lot of people like keeping their money on the exchange because now they don't have to worry about protecting their key. If you keep the money for yourself, you have to protect your key. So you have a file on your computer, you lose your computer, all your Bitcoin is gone, right? So you get malware and the malware grabs that, that file. Usually it's password wrapped or something like that, but but you know, there, there's lots of ways that, that you could lose your Bitcoin. Alternatively, you could just move your money onto an exchange. Now you have a username, you have a password, you can reset your password if you forget your password. You know, they're professionals, they, they're, you know, let them worry about the security of it, it's, it's better. Um, you know, it's better than me trying to manage my own uh, security. And so what ends up happening is people treat exchanges kind of like banks. And so they actually end up accumulating a lot of a, a lot of Bitcoin uh, for their customers and, and people just let it sit on the exchange. OK, so that's just a sort of backgrounder on, on how these exchanges work. Um, so the, the story I wanted to tell, the social engineering story, as I mentioned, happened to Ottawa. So it's not Coinbase. It was another exchange. I, I forget the name of it. Um, I don't see it written down here. Uh, but, but anyways, it was a smaller exchange based in Canada, um, in Ottawa. And what this exchange decided to do is instead of maintaining servers, you know, because you have to think of the physical security as well of the servers, right? If someone is able to walk up to the server, right, then they could pull all the Bitcoin off and, and things like that. So what they decided is we're going to pay someone else that specializes in hosting services. Uh, we're going to pay them to ma maintain our servers for us. So they chose a company called Granite Networks, which is a subsidiary of, of Rogers, I believe, uh, in Ottawa. And so anyway, so uh the the adversary in this case somehow figured out it pro it might not have been that hard to figure out based on ip addresses and things like that but they they figured out that this server was was uh at this granite networks place okay so we know this because there's a, a news article about it and so these are actually just direct quotes from the article and they don't all like cohere exactly but it gives you kind of the rough story of of what happened so uh the article mentions that the Bitcoin thief started a customer service chat session. So they're not even calling them or anything like that. It's just like one of those chat windows. Uh, so they go to Granite Networks and they, they open up help. Um, and they said, oh, you know, we we work at this exchange or, or we, we own the exchange and you have our servers and we need some updates done to the server. And at no point during the, the nearly two hour long conversation, was the caller asked to verify their identity. Uh, then we don't know exactly what happened, but they asked for some maintenance to be performed. And the people working at Granite Networks, they had physical access, like they were on premises. And so they were, they were, they were willing to do it. So they went, they rebooted the server in safe mode. That usually disables a lot of security features uh, that, that normally would run. Um, so now that it's in safe mode. And we also know that at some point, uh, they asked, the adversary asked the employees uh, to um, plug a laptop into it and, and basically allow them to sort of SSH into the laptop and then into the server. Um, and so between all of that, they were basically able to, um, they were able to steal 
all of the Bitcoin that was in the hot wallet. So it wasn't 100 percent of, of the exchanges. It was just, you know, 5 percent or 10 percent of, of what they own. But it was still one hundred thousand dollars. So it was, it was a fair amount uh, of money. OK, here's another story that I really like. Uh, this was uh, a, a story I heard a while ago from someone named Cormac Curley, who works at Microsoft Research and uh, has written a bunch of papers and uh, just has sort of interesting things to say uh, about security. And so he was giving a talk and this was the example that he gave. He said, OK, imagine that uh, you want to, you know, well, first off, what, what happens uh, with uh, sort of financial fraud is people steal people's bank accounts. They steal their credit card numbers and things like that. Um, a simple story would be someone steals it and then uses it. But usually what happens is it's kind of more industrial. So what will happen is some you know hacker group will steal a whole bunch of credentials because they'll, they'll breach a website that has a database of, of credit card numbers or something like that. And so they'll, they'll have like 10,000 of these credit card numbers, okay? And then instead of trying to use them themselves, what they do is they just sell them. So they go in, they breach the web server, they uh, steal the credit card numbers, then they put it on a marketplace. And so other people will come along and say, I want to buy the credit card numbers or yeah, all the credit card information. And then the person that did the hack will say, OK, here's two or three just to prove that, that, that they all kind of work. Go, go try these two or three out, try and buy something with them. You'll see that, they, that they're good. And then, um, and then, you know, then we'll, I'll sell you the rest. Okay. All right. So imagine that you went on one of these marketplaces and let's say there was a credit card and it, it's balance was $10,000. Okay. So there's $10,000 that's available for you to spend off of this credit card. You're going to get the credit card. You're going to get the number. You're going to get the username, password for the online banking, the expiry date, everything you need. Okay. So you, you basically will become this person uh, once you, you purchase this information. OK, so the question that Cormac asked was, how much would you pay? What, what do you think the going price is for a credit card or banking information uh, for, for that, that would have $10,000 worth uh, that, that you'd be able to spend? All right. So initially, I, I, you know, this is my thought process. You can you can think of it uh, through yourself. And so I thought, well, you're, you're not going to pay exactly ten thousand dollars. Right. Because you uh, I mean, there's there's a bit of friction. You have to take it over. It's kind of awkward to use. There's also a big risk that it just doesn't work. Right. And so you're probably going to pay something less than ten thousand dollars. So there's going to be a discount um, uh, just based on on, on the, the chances that you're, you're not able to extract the full ten thousand dollars from this. So I thought, well, you know, maybe it, it might be eight thousand of, of ten thousand dollars or um, it, it depends on the seller and their reputation and things like that and, and, and how, you know, the person might discover that this is this has been stolen. They might cancel it. So that's another risk. It's not the seller. It's not in the seller's control, you know. So, so maybe like like five thousand, that would be kind of the minimum that you would pay. And that's that's like a pretty safe. You're basically saying there's a 50 50 chance that this isn't going to work. Right. And so anyway, so so he gave his talk and then he said, OK, this is the, the answer. So the answer is 30 bucks. And I was shocked. I was just like, how could that be? That's that's not possible, right? Like like you're you're paying thirty dollars for ten for ten thousand dollars, right? Like how is this stuff uh, so cheap? And so the answer to the question is um, you have to think about how you're gonna try and use this. Okay. So let's say the adversary steals a hundred thousand dollars, okay? Um Every transaction that they do with this is because the banking system has identities. You can't open a bank account. Like say you want to move the $10,000 to your, your bank account. That's fine. But in order to open that bank account, you have to show government ID. Okay. So now, you know, the, the person who got their money stolen is going to report it stolen. And then the investigation is going to come to you because the money ended up in your account. Okay. So you can't just move money around the financial service in a way that's that's anonymous, right? Everyone is sort of um, uh, is, is identifiable. OK, so it's traceable. And the second thing is that if, you know, if 
the money is stolen and it's it's pretty easily established that it's stolen, what the banking system can do is they can reverse the transaction, right? So let's say that you moved it into your account. The bank says, oh, that was stolen. So they move the $10,000 back. Now, what if you already spent it, right? Doesn't matter. Now you have a negative $10,000 balance. Like you, you, you know, that money, you're, it's going to have to get paid back, right? Um, and so it turns out that it's, it's really hard to move money around within the banking system. And that's the main reason why, um, why, you know, something that's, that's, uh, you know, enormous amount of money, like a hundred thousand dollars or, uh, I guess I, I, I switched the slide, I should say 10 K, but, um, but anyway, that's why 10 K would sell for $30 or something or hundred K would sell for $300. Okay. So what the adversary does is uh, in order to move this money around, they, they use a, a slightly different kind of scheme or scam. Okay. So what they'll do is they'll steal the financial data and then they'll uh, email someone random. And you've seen these emails before. You probably just don't know what they're, what, what the scam is behind it. You know that there, there's some sort of scam behind it, but you, you might not know exactly what it is. Okay. So you get these emails and it's like, Oh, I, you know, Dear respected sir or madame, I, you know, I'm from another country and I have all this money and I need to move it, but you know, I, I can't do it for whatever reason. And so basically the, the bottom of line of the story is I'm going to send the money to you and you're going to send it to me. Okay. Uh, and for your trouble, you're going to keep a cut of the money, right? So, you know, maybe we're going to move around a hundred thousand dollars you know, you can keep 20,000 of it and I'm going to keep the other 80. Okay. Uh, and so this is the, the scam you get. Now, most people think like, like eventually they're going to ask for some money. Like there are a lot of scams like this too, where they'll just be like, okay, before we do the trade, you have to pay me a bit in order to do some paperwork. And that's a scam. They just steal the money. But this particular scam, if you went through with it, the money would actually show up. Okay. No joke. Like, so what would happen is um, they would give the money from the stolen credential to you and your account would actually go up uh, by $100,000. And then the adversary is going to be really on your case, breathing down your neck, trying to get you to send them the $80,000. They're going to ask you to do it through some untraceable mechanism, um, you know, you know, something like um, MoneyGram or, um, you know, these, these, these anyways, or maybe Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or something like that. Um, so they'll say, okay, uh, you know, uh, I guess I set it up where you actually keep 80 of the K and, and you only get 20. So it depends on, on what the ratio is or the ratio could be anyways, but anyways, you're going to send some fraction of the money to the adversary. Uh, it's going to be through an untraceable mechanism. And so the adversary will end up with that money and they'll be able to hang on to it. Okay. What's going to happen for you is let's say you have 80 K left in your bank account is uh, some days will go by and all of a sudden you'll get a notice from the bank that that money was stolen and they're sending it back to the person it was stolen from and the person it was stolen from, you know, they had a hundred thousand dollars stolen and, you know, too bad for you, you know, we're, we're going to take the 80 K back, but you're short 20 K, the 20 K that you sent. And now you're on the hook for that 20 K. Okay. So the person that actually did the bad thing of, having their credentials stolen, it's not always their fault. Like it, it could be on a website or something like that, but it, it could also just be that they, um, you know, but, but anyways, the, 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 vic the person you might say the victim is, is the person over on the right, uh, because their money was stolen. But at the end of the story, they actually get all their money back. Okay. So they're, they're fine. Right. The real victim was the person who got scammed in the middle, uh, because now whatever, percentage of the money they received, they sent to the adversary, they're short that amount of money. And so they're the ones, it's almost as if it's, it is as if the adversary stole the money from them rather than the adversary stealing it from the person who they stole the banking credentials from. Okay. So this person, it's called the, they're called the mule, uh, you know, in, in sort of this crime lingo. Uh, so they're, they're the ones that end up short. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next video, uh, sorry, the next story I'll, I'll tell you is, is another video. So this one's uh, a little bit longer uh, than the other video that we saw. And, uh, but it's, it's kind of fun 
Um, so the YouTube link is here. Again, I'll put it in the show notes. I did. I now know that uh, the previous video didn't work. Uh, so I, I'm not going to show it in this video. What's going to ha happen is I'm going to end this video. Uh, then this will be the next video in the playlist. And then you can come back and, and I'll finish the lecture.